Can you believe in evolution and still be an Orthodox Christian? Today on Where We Begin. Hey guys, welcome back to Where We Begin, a podcast where we discuss some of the toughest objections to Christianity. I'm your host, Derek, and I'm joined again by Alicia, Lou, and Zandra. How's it going? Gang? Hey, Excellent. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Derek, for asking. We don't, don't care don't how you, you are. <laughs> Derek, <laughs> we, we just to want to do are. the podcast. Can we just not do this every... I don't know if you think this comes across as charming, <laughs> no. but I can tell you... It does not. So, um, we would like to, kidding. today we have uh, a really interesting question, especially, Alicia, I know you've got uh, good thoughts on this, but we, we're talking also to two scientists. Now, Lou has already admitted that he doesn't remember anything <laughs> from biology, but um, but I think this will be interesting Lord. because uh, essentially w- what they've asked is this, can you be an Orthodox Christian and believe in evolution, or does that disqualify you as a true Christian? Now, there are two pressures here that make this difficult. One is, in in many ways, science has become the new, to some people, scientism, the new religion, scientists, the new priests, the, 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 those who are holding all the truth in the world, where all meaning comes from, but then a lot of Christians may have parents who, who there's a, a pressure the other way. You can't even think about it or you're somehow denying Christ, denying biblical truth because it's clear what Genesis says. So, um, yeah, let's talk about that. What what are some of the people that you've talked to through this question? I'm sure you've, t- you've talked to a lot of people on this. What what's the feeling out there? How well, I mean, as a as a molecular biologist, I mean, I feel like I can <laughs> remember like nothing. Can, can speak about this. And, yeah, no, I'm just do you even Sandra. remember what a molecule is? <laughs> I can we start know. there? I have some do you thoughts know what on biology. Here. No, I'm going to let Zandra <laughs> take this and just if I want to say anything today, maybe. I don't uh, okay, Sandra, how would yeah. you how would you answer? Let me be the host hmm, today, yeah. Sandra. How would you like to answer this question? I'm excited about this question. I love this question. I love nerdy yeah. science questions. And I didn't know. I did not know you were going to ask this. And I wore my nerdy like science Aww. like necklace. I had oh, no idea yeah. you were going to be a- asking this question. For those of you that are listening, it is nerdy. Actually, it's so it is nerdy. nerdy. What's on it? It's all the planets. Yeah, can oh, the God. camera See zoom in? No way. Oh. <laughs> Note that one is missing. Oh, because well, they there. took one away. Pluto's I thought they added it. Yeah. Back. It's been deplaneted. It's deplaneted. Have you ever noticed that all the planets are Talk named after gods, but this planet's named after that stuff on the ground? Isn't that weird? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> what a no, random thing. I have never <laughs> thought we, about no, that. Let's ask the, I stole the question, that. Please. I stole that. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> That's good. I don't even remember what question I'm answering now. I'm can all you, over the place. Can you faithfully ask- believe in both the Christian faith and evolution? Believe in evolution? Yes, you can. Um, I've met many people who take this view. It's what we call theistic evolution. So in theist, theistic evolution, you accept um, the five causes of, of Darwinian macroevolution, which are now, now let's see if I can remember my schooling, um, mutation, um, mating, genetic drift, natural selection, and... Oh, dang, there's one more. There's a fifth cause of Darwinian macroevolution. I'll come back to it. Um, But they accept that those driving forces are what create what what we've seen in terms of biological life and just in general the the structure of the universe. So even even though there's this sort of this sto- stochastic element if you will that this this randomness and this chance element that God used that as a tool to create what he created. So that he operated within the principle of evolution to create what we see. So that's theistic evolution and I've met many faithful men and women who love the word, who love the Lord, and um, 
yeah, I mean, they, they, they accept this wholeheartedly. So I think it is absolutely possible. I was one of those people, by the way, that <laughs> grew up in a household to be like anything other than a literal seven yeah. day. Like, and I remember when I went to, I mean, I went to a public high school and I just kind of like didn't listen to my teacher about like anytime we went into that realm I was like, oh, cause I just associated the word evolution with atheism. It's kind of just the way I was raised. But then when I, I went to a Christian university, I went to Grove City College and one of my professors was, we, we read the book, The Language of God by Francis Collins. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Francis Collins is, is no dummy. Uh, he's quite a brilliant man. Uh, one of the uh, head of the, yeah. yeah, head of the human genome project, yeah, right? He crashed into the code. code yeah, basically. brilliant guy. And, and I'm reading his book on his understanding. I was like, Wait the language second. of God. Yeah, is that the language the one of God. Yeah. Oh, I just remember the fifth one. Migration. There you go. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry <laughs> continue. Glad the language of God. But anyway, that was the first time when I was in college, that was the first time I realized this this understanding. I just I didn't even know there there was a case to be made mm-hmm. uh, for this understanding of being both a Christian and somebody that believes um in in evolution. So And and I think just to, to go back to this question, I think the reason why people ask this question and part of the rest though is because there's kind of two pieces of it there's there's the science piece obviously evolution but the real the the ultimate issue I think is in the theological implications and I think that's one of the reasons why people wrestle with it is not just because of because most people who who who, uh, who are in the Christian realm who hear who hear of evolution don't necessarily you know, dig into the science of evolution. What they what they hear instead is this is an alternative reading to what my Bible says about how Genesis and God created, what Genesis and what God created. And so for them, it's a theological challenge. And I, and I do think that that um, it is something that is that I can understand why people struggle with trying to trying to merge the two together. I'm not saying whether or not evolution is right or wrong. I'm just saying that part of the reason why that the struggle is there is because what does it mean for Adam? Who then is Adam? Mm-hmm. You know, and 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 in in evolution, essentially what you have is you have you know the, the you go from simple to more complex, more complex, and then you you know got the organisms continue to grow and evolve into different things. But eventually, what happens? It's not like you just get one human one day, right? You have like an entire group that eventually is and you know becomes what we consider human, whatever that is going to mean. Because now you got to ask when does somebody become a human versus what they previously were, and then so you've got that implication. You've got when did they become an image bearer of God, when did they get the image of God bear on them? At what stage of that process? And then once they got the image of God, did they then become morally responsible? But regardless, you had this happening to many, many beings at the same time. And then all of a sudden you have what, well, who is Adam? Mm-hmm. Is, is he one of these? And if so, which one is he? Did God just pick randomly pick one particular person out to be Adam? And then that's that, or, you know, like how did that happen? Or was Adam just symbolic? And the reason why there's implications. That's problematic. Right, no, right. We're getting they, into the realm. That's, yeah. and that's where and the theological skin, issues are. Skin, exactly. tricky. Well, Did here's they the have thing. belly buttons? That's the real question. Yeah, no, that's no, the main topic. Sorry. Derek. Uh, gosh, I hope so. <laughs> um, but now, just, just the, to finish that real quick, the reason why the Adam issue is a challenge is because you've got Jesus being yeah. called the new Adam. Right. Yeah. Right. So just to finish that off. Or, and, sin well, I think, I think there's more than that. Exactly. I think there's even more. Like, If you're going to say that Adam is purely like, a metaphor well, that, or like a symbolism. Like, I think we're running into. Well, can I, can I give yeah. a rundown real quick sure. of, of just, so the things that, um, cause the question, I, I think you can be a very devoted. Absolutely. Christian and believe in evolution. Yeah, but, absolutely. but this question is, can you be orthodox? And that would be, that is the tough question because Ooh. here are the things that you're, that essentially feel like, in a lot of the versions I've heard, here are the things you're asked to believe. And so, so we want to know, is there a real contradiction? Is there some truth out there that mm-hmm. contradicts the Bible? And that's a problem. Um, so the, the things that you're asked to believe, to, and tell me if you think this is fair with the people you've talked to. It mm-hmm. You have to believe in an old earth. That's a lot of people do that. Yep. And that's, that seems to be fine. Death before the fall. Yeah. No Adam and Eve. God's creation needing suffering to survive. And essentially, um, now that you've already said it's a guided process, but some would say God is actually unnecessary in this process. So it's a deism. We don't need God to do it. Right. Mm-hmm. If it's by chance. There's randomness. There's randomness. Right. Yeah. yeah. You can't so have a sign of randomness. Wait, you're saying that's what a theistic evolution, uh, evolution and I think has to believe. Is, this is where it's going to be really important for us in mm-hmm. the discussion to acknowledge 
that there are, there's a wide gamut of theistic evolution. Mm -hmm. And there are many theistic evolutionists who believe more kind of a deistic almost side where God created the processes Mm -hmm. and then stepped back and hands off and Mm -hmm. just let them sort of go the way that they go the way that they naturally would have went. And then there are more, um, towards the real ex nihilo idea of he created specifically out of nothing. This popped into existence when he said it, um, but then those things that popped into existence when he said it continued to evolve after they were created mm-hmm. ex nihilo. And so, and there's a whole gamut in between. And so um, I think it's important for us to acknowledge that as we continue in the conversation right. to be fair right. to our brothers and yeah. sisters out there who do believe in evolution, who are Christians at the same time. Um, now, right. did, so, I'm sorry, did you say that you were, uh, you do believe in theistic evolution? Personally, I do not. Okay. Uh, okay. So, no, I mean, which surprises people because I have a master's degree in biological science. Mm-hmm. I've done a lot of work in genetics um, and I've studied this a lot and it would mm-hmm. have been so much easier for me <laughs> to have accepted um, theistic evolution and that would have been a great way for me to marry my faith in cr- Christ with um, my research. But it was actually more on the scientific side that I found problems with evolution. Mm -hmm. Um, And actually, this is so funny because this morning I woke up to an email. Uh, It's an invitation to um, go to this symposium, this this conference in the Middle East. And it's going to be a gathering of some of the top biologists on the planet um, discussing these things. And the title that they chose for the symposium is so interesting because it's um, Potentials and Limitations of Evolution. And Mm -hmm. that's the topic for this year, for 2022, is potentials and limitations of evolution. So the top scientists, the top biological scientists in the world today are still discussing the limitations of this theory, Mm -hmm. just scientifically of this theory. And I think that's also worth acknowledging. Yeah. Yeah. uh, uh, Sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to just add on to, I mean, because one of the things, I mean, this, I feel like this is coming more and more scientists are are starting to express this, but part of the thing that we have to remember is evolution. When Darwin lived, it was in a very different era, right? We didn't understand the inner workings of a cell like we do now. Like he did not have, he was not privy to the information we had now. And there's a sense, which I've, I've often wondered for many years, if he came back today and saw us maybe holding on to certain parts of his theory, he'd be like, you, idiots like I didn't know what you know now like I wouldn't hold this view on this particular area if I knew what you guys knew and so there's a sense which you have to remember that when he was living he had only access to information that we are like flooded with you know whether it's the DNA and uncoding that whether it's all those little things that end up in a cell and so I just think that we it makes sense to me that people are would see limitations. And I'm actually happy to hear that people feel like they can be more vocal about those limitations because there is a sense in which you oftentimes in this within the scientific community, I've heard that if you if you try to express reservations about it, you know, you're kind of shunned. And we never want any field. I don't want anybody to say, I'm a Christian who's not allowed to ask questions. I don't want anybody to say that about science. I don't want anybody mm-hmm. to say that about any field. We should always be able to unpack it further if we see any issues with it. Mm-hmm. I've, I mean, even when I was studying <laughs> like the biology, I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I was doing this because I thought I was going to be a doctor. So get off my back. I can see oh. you judging me, Derek. Uh, I didn't want <laughs> yeah, to study. Yeah, you would have never made it as I a doctor. I didn't want to. No, I, I was going to be fine with that. This is I mean, I'm loved. human biology. I'm so happy. You yeah, thank you. That. Sorry. It was a lot different. Um, but I always found it like really interesting. Like when I was learning the, like the evolutionary process, like it, it did a good job of explaining mutation, and and I just remember the, the peppered moth and the Galapagos finches. Like you, you see, it's like yeah, it's like both those small, of, both of which weren't te- technically macroevolution, by the sure. way. Uh, well, okay, well this is the stuff I remember, but I remember seeing looking that, and I was like, yeah, like this this may, it does a great job of explaining these things, but it never got to the, like, but how from a single cell organism do we get to complex life like and, I, and, the, and the same thing with That's like the, the one thing I do remember from molecular like, biology is like I just remember the, the circle of DNA RNA and proteins like you need DNA DNA to make RNA and you to make then proteins but then you need proteins to, to make, make DNA. DNA and I'm just like mm-hmm. I don't know this is where Which I always came just go, first how did it start? yeah it's just like a weird like so I always just like this is a com- and how we get to the bottom that's why I kind of just like back off from it. I was like I don't I don't know how this all works out but it seems compelling to me. Well, and that's the thing about science, right? Science can explain yeah. 
the process. It can yeah. explain, well, yeah, DNA to mm-hmm. RNA. Like it can explain that process, but it can't explain where it came from. Yeah. Um, so, so a lot of what we see in, in macroevolution is operation science, what we call operation science, but it's not origin science. Yeah. It doesn't explain right. where it came from. It just explains how it works. Right. And it's great that we have a way of explaining how things work. Mm-hmm. That's why I love science. I'm fascinated by science. Mm-hmm. I'm a total nerd. Anyone who knows me knows what a nerd I am. But it doesn't answer every single question. It certainly doesn't answer the question where we come from. So, and I think that's one thing that theistic evolution tries to do is tries to take an operation science and sort of convert it or conform it into also being an origin science uh, or right. an origin explanation. Right. Um, and so, and again, I, I think in, in some forms it works okay and in other forms I think it just doesn't because once you get into more like the deistic forms, it, yeah, it doesn't work. And also like a lot of things that people say are macroevolution are not macroevolution at all. They're just phenotypic plasticity, like the finches mm-hmm. or the moths. Can you explain so, those terms? Sorry. At least macro and micro, just to make sure everybody. So just for the, I mean, macro, I, I know what you're talking about because yeah. of molecular biology, but for those <laughs> listening that don't He's know. He's a microbiologist who remembers <laughs> no, everything. No, no, molecular, he's I'm not a micro. Oh, you're not? Molecular. Oh. What's the difference between micro and molecular? I couldn't tell you, but <laughs> there is a difference. Well, I'll tell you the difference between micro and macro okay. evolution. <laughs> macro evolution is a change in allelic frequencies over time. So it means your genome, your your genetic composition is actually changing. And that's where you get speciation, where you get an act, a new species is arising through these processes. Okay, so that's macroevolution. Then there's microevolution, which you can watch happen under a microscope. And that's just where um, your your phenotype is changing. So I can have a tank of guppies and I can breed them over time and select for the male guppies that have really long fins and eventually get a population of really long finned guppies that look a particular way. And that's microevolution. So that's just when I say phenotypic plasticity, I'm talking about phenotype is what's on the outside. Phenotype's kind of like how you look. Genotype, macroevolution, what's on the inside. What's in the DNA? Yeah. So can, can I ask a question? Is the answer because sorry, <laughs> Go I'm going to constantly take your job from you, Derek. It's not that I don't think you're good at it. I just yeah, want you, it. You I'm, get I'm it. Really, I, this is what I wanted. I actually wanted to be the host. So. I don't feel threatened. Well, okay. Just to clarify. <laughs> why aren't you like if you whatever in two minutes? Why aren't you a theistic evolutionist? Like why, why is that not the the realm you because you as somebody that has studied science, you see the compelling arguments from brilliant scientists on both sides, both Christian and non Christian. Like why have you remained at a place where you'd say, no, I'm, I, I don't believe this to be true? Mm. Well, I think uh, it came out of a period of really intense investigation because it was something that I thought, you know, I, I should believe in and that was probably true and I wanted to understand why it was true. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized, wait a minute, I don't think that this can be true. Mm. And a big part of that is the genetic side. I mean, you've got brilliant minds like um, geneticist John Sanford, who literally invented the gene gun, who did the work. He created Mendel's accountant, which is a way of mapping how genes change over time because he wanted his ba- his main project was to see how long it would take to move from our ape-like predecessor to Homo sapiens. How many years would that have taken for macroevolution to do that successfully? And even with perfect parameters, put into the system, it took longer than the known age of the universe. So it's a huge Jeez. time problem. It just seems like something has to have interacted from outside. And, and I've looked at the math, I've looked at the numbers, and it's somewhere between four to the power of a hundred and four to the power of a neg- negative 183 to the power of 110,000 to like one number that's slightly different from that. But it's basically, it's impossible. The jump mm-hmm. from yeah. non-life to life the jump from non-life to life, you're talking about from a single cell to right. all of life. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about before that. Yeah. How do you get from nowhere to that cell? Which is why Francis Crick, who, you know, helped discover DNA, mm-hmm. invented this idea of panspermia, like aliens mm-hmm. did it. Right. I Thank don't know you. how this got here, this incredible complex DNA strand. Well, uh, well, let's just say that aliens came and left life on this planet because it's so, so incredibly impossible that this could have happened. Um, so, I mean, so as of now, as a biologist, I guess I'm not allowed to believe in God, but I'm allowed to believe in aliens. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't really make sense to me. Um, I think it's it's a very viable option to say. Uh, I think that 
God did this and it couldn't have just been natural processes. I believe that he does work in natural processes, but I don't, I think that there are, there are some strengths to Darwinian macroevolution. We know that things change over time. We've seen that that's observable, but I don't think the, that all of the assumptions we've made about it thus far are completely accurate. I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. I've never met anybody be able to actually explain to me how we know that evolution is like the process by which, like anybody that so you believe in this, like uh, explain it to me. I've there's never a met, lot of a priori I've never, met, I've never arguments. met anybody be able to explain it to me well because mm-hmm. I'm always like... Yeah, I mean, and, there, and there's other people out there who will. I don't necessarily have the science background to challenge them. I think what it would be interesting is to have someone who does, like Xandra, to be able to, because I definitely have heard people say, this is why I believe it. This is why it's so strong. But, I, but you know, they go into all kinds of things that I just I just wouldn't even know about. And so I'd be really interested in, in, in you know, somebody else being in that dialogue. But regardless, I think what you said is actually really important. I think this is, this is why we have such a push of evolution is because it isn't, it is about, it's been made to be about origins and not operation. In other words, you know, the, the big question that, 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 that so many people have, how did we get here? Right. The five-year-old asked mom, mom, how did we get here? Right. This is the question that humanity's had for whoever knows how many years, right? And so it's like, do we have the answer? Do we have the answer to that question? And it gives people the ability to have that, the answer to that question apart from any kind of divine or alternative thing. Panspermia, of course, would put you back into that camp. Whatever the camp is of there being some kind of outside source, it's just like, is there a way that this is happening kind of on its own? So I think that the origin thing is is the really the key reason why I think so many people have really dug their heels into this. But just to go back to what you're saying, Derek, about what makes it orthodox, because you read a list of things there. Or it's not what makes it orthodox. Can you be an orthodox Christian and, and believe? And you read one of the things I think you read was um, it made so something like that there was um, evil was a part of creation and, you know, this idea of Adam and Eve. Right. And so and so so to answer your question was, um, you know, can you be an orthodox Christian and believe in evolution? I would say I. I, I would be willing to say I would I would give it more time before I answered that, because I think one of the I think something that the theistic evolution movement is trying to do is answer the theology. And they recognize that they do have a challenge when it comes to the theology. And so I'm happy to give them that time to consider because I know several people are theistic evolutions, evolutionists and they are sincere Christians um, and they do love the Lord. And so I really don't question their belief, but it does. But they do recognize we, they have to work on the theology. And so I think giving them some time to be able to unpack that because they are aware of those issues. Um, maybe in a few years, we'll have a better grasp on that. Maybe in 15 years, we'll have a better grasp on answering those a little bit better. But that's where I would land on that. Yeah, and there are people, uh, and just to, to point out too, there are, you know, there are organizations like BioLogos yep. that are attempting to do this every day. There They're are people, people like mm-hmm. uh, Joshua Swamidas who wrote a really interesting yeah, book Swamidas. on genealogical Adam and Eve that you, you could have an original uh, genealogical mm-hmm. pair. Um, and he's a, a computational biologist. So pretty interesting. But um, yeah. one last thing I want to get to, we're, we're running out of time, but I want to give, um, perhaps we could give some people a little room to breathe and just feel like they can even look into these things. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times the the charge is you're only believing in evolution because of this cultural pressure to do it. Yeah. And we could point out that actually before the theory of evolution, there were Christians like Basil the Great, Augustine, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Aquinas, who did not take that sort of literalistic view of uh, the early chapters of Genesis, the the six literal 24-hour days of creation, um, who recognized that maybe there is a different point being made and maybe there's a different way to read it literally. Um, what do you guys think of, you know, are there, are there, is there freedom in that? How would you even maybe give some tips on reading Genesis? Well, uh, oh, sorry. Well, I don't know. I, I would say like when, when you're trying to answer the question of like science and faith, like, I think as Christians, we need to be we need to be very careful to say what the Bible says and not a word more, not a word less. And I think we actually get really good at saying more than what the Bible says in certain things. And and we also got to realize, like, the Bible isn't a science textbook. It's it, Sometimes we go to it trying to use it the way we would read our biology textbooks. We're like, well, this is, this doesn't work. Like, there's a, there's a contradiction here. Um, and so I, my, 
again, the thing I learned when I was in college was like, you start looking at the between Genesis one and two, and you're like, well, wait a second. If I take this completely literally, there's two different stories happening right here, and they do seem to to contradict each other. If I'm going to do that that way, so. I think to make sure that we understand the different genres of scripture, like I think we so often go to scripture as in like one book and it is one book, but it's kind of like a library. I mean, you're talking about like over 40 some authors and over, written over thousands of years long. And we're, and we're trying to pretend like it was, yes, there is one true author behind it all, but like we have to go and go to it with a lot of humility. But I, the one thing I've always said, just as somebody that even came with a science background and where I got, like I said, I, I wanted to go into medicine was like, what I loved about science is science could always tell me um, how we could take, say, a kidney from somebody and, pl- and put it into another body in that work. Like th- the idea that like, how did that come up? How did, but the thing is that science never could tell me why in the world someone would give up their kidney to save somebody else's life. Like there's other questions that we're trying to ask that are just as important. And I think we just need to be very careful as Christians that we don't fall into this like scientism view of like only science can ask and answer the questions that are important to us. It's ridiculous. It answers some powerful, powerful questions. But there are some questions that science just cannot touch that are so relevant to the human experience. And that's where I would say, so just like when you're looking at Genesis, have a bit of humility of understanding this is this is a complex book this is a uh, there is poetry in there there is different literary devices that if you just try to go in there and be like i'm a christian i have the holy spirit so i'll understand this perfectly you're going to miss some things and i think we actually have christian history to show us the ways we've done this poorly right mm-hmm. we have the copernican revolution we know what happened yeah. like when the church was like no this is what it says like well actually the scripture really wasn't saying that that was the way you were going about trying to interpret it yeah. And, and yeah, that's, you have to kind of let it speak on its own and let it set the parameters of what the questions are and then understand the answers through that. Yeah. yeah. And just one quick thing, you know, before we finish out, it's just, we've talked about evolution. We talked about kind of young earth, but it is important just for us to note that there is also other views <laughs> than just, yeah. the, just what yeah. we talked about. And, and, you know, one of the other big prevalent views is that, is that, um, you know, days were longer periods of time than 24 hours in, in, in Genesis. And so they have an old earth view, but they don't believe evolution was the means to which God created. So you've got different views out there. I just want to mm-hmm. make sure that I let people know that it isn't just evolution or, or right. the six days. There's a variety <laughs> of other views that. Yes, that we just didn't discuss today. Yeah. yeah. And the beautiful Thanks. thing is that each of those views, those three main views and all the ones in between, they all say the same thing with regards to the very beginning of Genesis, right. which mm-hmm. was in, in the, the beginning, beginning, God. Exactly. Not in the beginning, random processes yes. or in the beginning, quantum vacuum or whatever. In the beginning, God. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that's a beautiful thing and something important for us to remember. Yeah. Yeah, And and I haven't met uh, even theistic evolution uh, advocate yet that I couldn't link arms with and recite the Nicene Creed together. I agree. We need to kind of even remember. Is that that your way of saying that you cannot be orthodox and a theistic evolutionist? Reciting the Nicene Creed? No. (laughs) Do you understand history? (laughs) Never mind, right, Derek. Good one, Lou. Um, so we're gonna <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna close it there. Uh, I did just want to end with a there was a uh, quote I heard once from William Lane Craig talking about the anthropic cosmological principle. It's a book, and he pointed out that those authors there actually said if evolution did indeed occur, then it would have had to have been a miracle. In other words, evolution is literally evidence for the existence of God. So even if it is true, and I just thought that was fascinating. So, yeah, uh, yeah we just want to say we love our theistic evolution, brothers and sisters, <laughs> yes, our do. young earth brothers and sisters, yeah. old earth, no oh, evolution brothers and sisters, <laughs> and other views. I'm sorry if I've left you out, mm-hmm. but um, hey, I hope you had fun today. I know I think we did, and uh, <laughs> we learned a lot today. So thanks. Zandra, for all that yeah. background info. Yeah. Um, Rob, you you sh- give me a shout out. Thanks, so, thanks, thanks, thanks for that. Yeah, please, uh, forgot, Lou. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, if you want, yeah, comment below all that good stuff. And uh, if you want us to uh, answer your questions on the show, uh, email us at where we begin at lightengroup.org. Yeah, thanks. We'll see you next week. <laughs>